President Proctor, go ahead. Okay. Um, item four, approval of the agenda. Motion to approve tonight's agenda. Second. Thank you, Trustee Watkins and Trustee Chin. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Everybody said aye. Um, we can move on to item 5A, public statements related to agenda items. Please limit statements to three minutes. Can we check if there's anybody on Zoom that would like to make a public comment at this time? Yes, if there's anybody in the in the Zoom audience that would like to make public comment, please use the raise hand function within Zoom now. And we have one person so far that would like to make public comment. Amy, I'm going to allow you to talk. You will have three minutes. And go ahead and unmute when you're ready. Hi, everyone. Um, I am sorry, moving windows on my computer. Um, I am looking forward to hearing the presentation and discussion tonight. And given that the focus is special ed, this felt like the right time to make this comment. Um, as a person who's attended and listened to many board meetings over the years, there's been a pattern of certain people, both board members and commenters, of regularly pulling out and commenting on a common um, consent agenda item, the amount of budget spent on NPS and NPA providers. So if you're going to take away anything from my comment today, I hope it is this. Number one, by routinely commenting on the need to reduce the amount of money spent on NPS and NPA, it feels that you're marginalizing the needs of a portion of our special needs community with the most complex needs. And number two, budget spent on NPS and NPA will always be a non-zero number. So if we're going to focus the narrative on budget spent, please think to be more constructive and find ways to identify areas to improve our programming and hiring practices. To dig into my first point, the spectrum of services required to support our special needs community. And in some cases, those needs cannot be met of what any district is able to provide. It often feels as though the belief is we should be able to just flip the switch and our district would easily be able to provide these services within our walls. If we believe this, we're frankly diminishing the complexity of student needs. Subjectively, I know many families who have NPS placements and NPA providers, one of my children having multiple people on his team from non-public agencies. In many cases, these placements and providers have transformed their child's experience and access to education. Objectively, our district is not unique in placing students in NPSs, using NPAs, or allocating funding to do so. More importantly, the process of a child to receive an NPS placement isn't easy. It's often a result of years of failure to service the needs of a child, along with frustration, tears, and frankly, anger on the part of both students and parents. So if we all decide to continue the practice of routinely pulling out these consent agenda items, discussing and debating the necessity of spending budget on NPS and NPA, Please remember that behind each of those numbers is a child and family attempting to do their best to gain access to education, which they rightfully deserve. To be clear, the district can and should do better. So if we're bought into the idea that the budget will be a non-zero number, when we do discuss it and what districts should do to improve, we should look to be more constructive and identify ways to measure the relative effectiveness of our programs, hiring and teacher and staff retention. With relative ease, I believe we should be able to do this by benchmarking our peers. Thanks to Heather, we have data showing the number of students serviced by this funding. If we take that ratio and compare it to other districts, how do we compare? And if it, in that comparison we determined we spend more relative budget, we should reach out and understand what services or programs those districts are providing and assess whether it could be a success in our district. So in closing, I ask that if people have a particular passion for this topic, that whatever the end goal may be, that you remember that behind the numbers are children. And if you do continue, bring up the topic to be more constructive and find ways to drive the narrative forward. Thank you. Thank you. If there are any other members of the public that would like to speak using Zoom, please use the raise hand functionality within Zoom now. President Proctor, go ahead. There are no more members who would like to make comment. Okay, thank you so much. We will go on to 6A, 
um, special education study session, and then I'll hand it off to Dennis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So good evening, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Ochoa. We're very pleased to present to you tonight um, the special education study session. With me is Director of Special Education, um, Heather Morgan, mm -hmm. and Assistant Director, Kira Nazario. The discussion points for this evening will be around, some of them will be about the behavior team, sensory rooms, our district program locations, a roadmap for special ed, staffing updates, um, some comparison of data from CAS scores, as, wrong as, as, well, as well as some DNQs and initials. Okay. Go ahead, Heather. All right, thank you. Um, Again, I'm Heather Morgan. I'm the Director of Special Education. Um, I would like to explain what you have in front of you just um, so that you can see. We've prepared um, not only this, uh, these are just the slides that we're gonna be going through, but underneath that in order are um, the supporting documents for each of our conversations today. So I just wanna make sure you knew that have that. The only one that's not in order is the big roadmap is in the back because um, it's big. <laughs> so I just wanna make sure you had all of that. So the first um, talking point for today is uh, the develop of our behavior development of our behavior team, and you do have some supporting documentation on that. It's uh, the pyramid um, sheet. So uh, what we really wanted to highlight today was that um, in the what, what we were able to provide last year, what we've changed for this year, and then what next year looks like in terms of the development of the behavior team. So in 21-22, um, we did designate one coordinator as a behavior team lead, and that person oversaw all of the behavioral, behavioral technicians, we call them BTs. Um, and that was pretty much it. It was a very singular kind of parallel <laughs> um, structure. And we uh, very early on recognized the need for a more robust structure. So as you know, this year, um, we have a coordinator at the top who oversees our three newly hired um, BCBAs or board certified behavior analysts, and they oversee the reg registered behavior techs and, the, and all of the BTs that work under them as paras. Um, we also added the para three classification and created some training modules to be completed prior to applying for that para three position. Recording in progress. The um, for next year, so for 23-24, looking forward, we continue. We're planning to continue this expansion. Um, there's increased need for behavior support in both general education and special education CF setting. And um, through the lens of MTSS, we are deploying our BCBAs and RBTs, um, not only for students with special education, but also for students in the general education program um, in an attempt to interrupt behaviors that may eventually land them in um, sort of a pathway for special education, um, which is in many cases inappropriate. So um, this is an important um, structure and we wanna continue building that for next year. Okay, um, so, and then I can move on to Dennis, if you wanna talk a little bit about our sensory room. Sure. So this year we've actually, the district has supported a sensory room starting at Lead Elementary um, with the support from the occupational therapist to give input on that sensory room program. Um, the, the lead sensory room is just about ready to open. I know Superintendent Ochoa and Director Morgan and a few others were there this week to look at it. But the idea of the sensory room is that eventually every school with the STC program with preschool or, and K-2-2 classrooms will have a sensory room. Students will have the opportunity to use these rooms as a place to go and um, take a sensory break, uh, get, engage in a different way, get their senses going um, to really have a break. I don't know if you want to comment on Yeah, so many of the students, especially in the primary um, grades and the preschool program, um, have what we refer to as sensory diets. And it's part of their diagnosis and their program and, and their um, needs within their IEP. And so this provides a location and also all of the different structures and materials that they use as part of that, they call it a sensory diet. So you may have something kind of like built into your day where like you work for an hour or two and then you go take a break and it's a designated space, a designated time. Um, and we wanna really carefully um, manage that because we don't want it to become a place just to like 
where somebody is having an issue to sort of leave them or put them there. That's not the point of the room at all. It's very much designated specifically for um, occupational therapy and occupational um, therapists like oversight and um, where students will, will go in a very a purposeful way um, to get their sensory needs met. So the next section is about uh, program updates and implications. Uh, there is a handout in the packet for the next uh, two years. Um, so uh, as you know, from last year to this year, we made some changes in locations and program placements. Um, yeah. um, so in the 21 and 22 school year, um, our district programming across the district is very lopsided, having some complexes having significantly more programs than others, which meant for those in the complexes that didn't have as much, it was long bus rides, removing them from their um, home schools and you know where their siblings attend. So this year we moved some programs to make that a little bit more distributed evenly. Um, which has allowed students to attend schools, schools close to their home. Um, but we're already looking at next year and kind of just continuing this redistribution um, and looking at uh, the potential of opening a therapeutic class to accommodate children who are currently served by some of our MPSs in the area that um, may have needs that we don't have current programming for to bring them kind of back home, um, close to the home and in the district where we can serve them. Yeah, um, I'd like to just expand on that a little bit too. We have some sort of proposed ideas. They're not um, completely um, fleshed out yet, but um, you can see sort of some of our, you know, thoughts about where things may go and where we may expand programs, especially in places where this year we added, for example, like K2 programs. We're thinking to add 3-5 programs so those students can stay at the schools that they're currently attending. Um, we're also looking at adding um, hopefully a therapeutic classroom next year internally, which would be for students maybe diagnosed with um, emotional disturbance or um, other other like more impacted students that we currently are unable to serve with our current programs. And those are students who do end up going to non-public schools and um, other sorts of programs that are outside of the district. Um, if we create this program, it's done with the um, the goal of bringing students back so that we are able to serve them ourselves. And that would require um, the staffing of a therapeutic program, which usually includes uh, like a full-time psychologist, a counselor, med specialist in the room. Um, and so we're looking at different locations right now and examining what that would look like and where we could Okay, so I'm going to share with you the year-long roadmap. That is the longer, colorful document here. And this roadmap was designed um, to highlight the like four big areas for special education for the school year, um, and also to explain the connections back to the strategic plan. And um, all the decisions that we make and everything that we do um, should essentially come back to this and be driven by the strategic plan so that we're all in alignment with all the decisions that were prioritized when that was developed. So the first one is um, our data-driven pro programs and practices. Our goal there is to uh, increase student academic achievement for students with disabilities, and we do have some data on that to share as well. Um, in doing this, we're ensuring that all students have access to grade level curriculum and standards, and we're providing supplemental evidence-based cur curriculum and cross-department PD opportunities for all staff. The connection to the strategic plan for data-driven programs and practices is goal one, which is creating learning opportunities for all pre-K through eighth grade students, resulting in closing the achievement gap, culminating in personal and academic success in high school and beyond. The second category is equity-driven practices. And our goal here is to disrupt inequitable outcomes for students with disabilities. Um, this is based on our SIGDIS work or significant disproportionality work, which is where we are over-identifying um, right now the category, of, as we've discussed in the past, is our um, primary students who are male and Latinx. Um, and they're uh, identification is to, um, specific learning disability. 
Also, we have developed the Inclusion Task Force, which is now underway. We've had two meetings so far this year. Um, we, we also have our Dual Identified Learners Committee, which is a joint effort between special education led by Kira and also, um, <laughs> also worked with um, uh, Dr. Uh, Aleda Barrera-Cruz and Dale Rogers. And um, we also have the district behavior team, which I just described the kind of pyramidal structures of, um, which should increase access to instruction through behavior support and training. And the connection to strategic plan here is goal two, which is to reduce inequitable outcomes for all students and staff by prioritizing equity, access, and inclusion. The third area uh, is family and community partnerships. Um, and our goal here is to foster community partnerships to provide a sense of belonging with inclusiveness for those um, with disabilities. And so some of the ways that we do that are uh, through CDAC, which is our, um, it's not quite monthly, we do a little, little more spread out than that, but it's our parent um, special education district advisory committee. And then um, we like we have a meeting next week, actually. We'd like everyone to know about that. Please attend. We have a special speaker coming, um, and she will be discussing inclusion. Um, also, partnership with the San Mateo Foster City Ed Foundation, which is really exciting because they um, are supporting a field trip that we're taking for all students with disabilities. Uh, we're gonna, the first wave of that field trip will happen in December. And we're going to um, a place in Sunnyvale called AAH, which is Animal Assisted Happiness. And um, also some new initiatives that we're moving forward with, like Best Buddies, Special Olympics, um, both of those, um, those are actually sister nonprofits and we're um, working to partner with them to develop opportunities for inclusion, both uh, during the school day, which like Best Buddies is kind of like a lunchtime club, um, for both general education and special education students to get together. And Special Olympics, as many of you may be familiar with um, that organization, and that's um, after school sports um, culminating in um, a big uh, Olympic <laughs> uh, competition. Um, that's very new, and we're just learning about that. Just really quick, um, the people online are saying it's hard to hear you. Oh, is there a way to turn up the sound? Okay. Here, there we go. Hopefully that's better. I'll try to yell. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, and then the connection to the strategic plan for family and community partnerships is goal three, which is to provide a safe, caring, nurturing and culturally responsive environment for all students to meet the needs of the whole child. And then finally, the last section of our roadmap is systems and accountability. So our goal here is to monitor and support IEP compliance requirements per the California Ed Code. And so in doing this, we are doing IEP compliance monitoring. What that looks like is we um, will just sort of randomly pick IEPs here and there, and Kira and I will go through and kind of audit them for completeness or any places where there may, they may not be legally defensible or there's some, some sort of mistakes. And those are things that we can use to build the capacity of our teams and make sure that they're learning to do um, the most compliant um, programs and IEPs for our students. Um, also, um, IEP service tracking, which is um, at the end of this year, it will be a, ma a mandate from the state. So we're starting that already to make sure that all, all services are tracked um, every, we turn them in monthly, but best practice is to do it weekly um, so it doesn't back, uh, backlog. And then also department reorg to streamline um, support. And that includes what we started this year with having, um, adding the position of assistant director and having a coordinator in charge of each of the four um, complexes. And then also internal file audits, which again is very similar to compliance monitoring, but that's a, a more complete look at a student's whole file and seeing, um, you know, looking within it to make sure that everything in it is compliant and correct. And um, that also connects to goal two, just like the equity driven practices, which uh, is to reduce inequitable outcomes for all students and staff by prioritizing equity access and inclusion. So this document, um, as I mentioned before, it is designed um, to be our roadmap and our guide in all the decisions that we make and everything that we do within the special education department. And um, I wanted to make sure that uh, everyone 
here, was familiar with it and um, understood our, our goals and our priorities. Um, and it's also available on the website and is being shared with all of the um, respective groups within our department. So I think at this point, um, if you any of you have questions for me or for the team. Um, I have just a couple of questions. I'm wondering if we could just maybe dive a little deeper into some of them. Yes, please. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what the inclusion task force is and, yes. and how that works. And then also um, we've talked a few times or many times, I guess, about the significant dis or disproportionality yes. work. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about like what what are we doing and how do we you know okay. get back into like a more proportional yes like how are we doing this yes, yes. so for um, the inclusion task force is um, we put it together this year it's um, grown to a really nice size we have about 18 members um, representative of parents gen ed teachers special education teachers administrators. Um, all different ages. So we have preschool representatives. Um, I'm trying to think, of, we have the social workers involved. I'm trying to think who else is on it. So a broad representation of um, pretty much every single kind of category you can think of. And um, our goal is to come up with um, a recommendation for what inclusion could look like on a district wide level. The reason that we started it, this was um, the work going into inclusion in our district had had good heart behind it in the years past, but it was um, it was kind of sporadic and not consistent across the schools. So we're what we wanted to do was take a step back, really take a deep dive into best practices, what's been successful in other districts, what's fiscally manageable, um, also what the implications would be for HR, like what are the staffing implications? Are we going to need more people to do this, or is how are we going to use the people that we currently have? Um, Oh, those are other two categories that are included in the committee. I also have um, the business department and HR involved in, in the meetings, um, our monthly meetings. And so um, at this point, we're, we've done a little bit of work because um, we just had our second meeting um, and we're diving into sort of the, the recommendations of the CDE and what their best practices are, especially in starting with early childhood programs for inclusion. And um, moving forward, we will start going into some other um, districts that have su successfully implemented this and um, examining you know, what the implications will be for us. And then um, hopefully by April, we should have a recommendation for you all as to what we think this could look like for the 23-24 school year. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. <laughs> and then in terms of SIGDIS, um, so significant disproportionality, um, even though it, uh, it falls on the shoulders of special education because what's happening is too large of numbers of children have been identified um, for requiring special education services. However, that actually is um, the, the problem stems from pre-referral. So this is more of a gen ed issue. So what we've done as a district to start to um, disrupt this is the development of all the interventions that we have in place. So for example, PATH for our primary readers, um, the behavior team is there to support kids when they're uh, having any, some kind of behavior problems that are impeding their ability to access their education. Um, we have SPIRE is being used um, as an, uh, an intervention. It's also a support tool once you've been identified, but it can be used also for reading intervention at the older students. And all of the and um, also MTSS and you know all the things that we put in place in hiring um, Dr. Haven and Dr. Heredia in the student services side of the house, which they're not special education, but they're supporting on the gen ed side um, to prevent students from being uh, jumping to referrals too soon in the process. In the process, and we also. Oh yeah. If I can chime in. Yeah, um, thank, you. thank you. Hi everybody. How are you? I miss you guys. You guys. It looks like a lot of fun in there. Um, it's a party, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a big party. But um, you know, the other thing that we're trying to do is what we're saying is we want our school teams, our principals, our counselors, our teachers. We want them to meet with parents early on when a child's in kindergarten. 
when the child's in first grade. So we can start giving interventions to a child when they're five and six years old. So this year for the first time, our student services department, Dr. Haven with Dennis's support, pre-populated lists of kids for the entire district, every school, and gave those lists to our principals indicating these are kids we need to get involved in what's called a student study team or an SST. Uh, we think that's gonna have a really dramatic impact on kids getting help early in their general education setting. So that, because what you wanna try to rule out is you, you have two kids, Ken and myself, we're both in the same first grade class, both of us are struggling. If we both get six or seven interventions and I start to make progress, my mom and dad don't want me to get tested for special ed. I'm making progress. I'm, I'm getting closer to grade level. If Ken's getting those same interventions and it's not helping him, then we need to think about what else we might be missing. And a special education referral might be warranted. But it's just one of these it's sort of a process thing and it takes time, um, but the work is already underway. Thank you. Um, so right, that is, that's the plan, is that we've got interventions in place that we never had before. It's far more robust and we're insisting on it. We're also insisting on cycles of inquiry prior to referrals. So when people, the old knee jerk thing would be to come to a special ed and say, this kid needs evaluation. And we're saying, no, wait, like, go through these processes, you know, use the interventions that we're providing, have the meetings with the parents, have the meetings with the teacher, employ the behavior team, employ footsteps to brilliance, employ all, you know, all of these other things that we have in place to give the kids a chance to excel um, before um, suggesting that there might be um, something more serious going on that requires special education. So in doing so, um, we're looking for, so like I will be doing month to month comparisons, but looking for fewer referrals, um, you know, fewer overall um, qualifications or, an, or um, initials. And um, that's something that we'll be monitoring over the course of the year. It's still very early in the year. Um, kids haven't had their, you know, only a couple of months in now. So um, usually we don't get referrals this early. Um, if, if we do, then they may be a carryover from last year. But we, as, as we move into the school year, we'll start monitoring um, that and keeping an eye on it. We should be seeing a decrease in it because we're asking people to do the pre-referral interventions. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have a couple of questions. Um, but are we going to be talking about classrooms in more depth? I mean, I know you all talked about the sensory, but mm -hmm. I, I know that um, there's the emotionally mm -hmm. classroom students with emotional disturbance. Yes. Right. Class. Thinking about adding that. Yeah. Are, are you guys, I'm just, I'll ask a question about it if you're not planning to go in more depth, but if you are, I'll wait. Go ahead, no, go ahead and ask and um, I can fill it in as, as needed. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to get a little bit more information about um, like the process and strategy for like, how did we decide that we wanted to open these classes? How did we decide where? Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of supports are in place at these school sites for supporting the transitions? Because they're um, like, how are we supporting staff, like all staff, uh, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I just like, I'm curious to know a little bit more yeah. about that. So um, there are, the, the, the starting point is the need for the class, right? So we have many students that um, if we don't currently have a program that uh, is able to serve them for whatever their needs are, we have to outsource. And that's where we end up sending kids to non-public schools um, and so in, in looking at the numbers of kids that we're sending and, and trends in maybe, um, you know, different groupings of kids that, that attend other schools, we determined that we probably have um, enough students that with the properly designed class, we could bring them back, which is, um, would be awesome. And so um, in terms of location, uh, I am going to be during the Thanksgiving break, actually visiting some of the campuses to look for um, places that not only have space, but have space in sort of ideal spots of the school. Um, we're looking for accessibility. We're looking for inclusion. We want, you know, kids to feel like they're part of a, um, 
uh, you know, a, a comprehensive school and that they're not, you know, stuck off in the, you know, a portable in the back somewhere. We want them to be part of the school. Um, but really the first thing, the first step is staffing. So um, I've already started um, advertising and looking for the specific staff you need in a class like that. A uh, therapeutic classroom really depends on um, the correct placement and the correct choice of the people who are there. So as I mentioned before, we need to have a designated psychologist. We need to have a designated counselor. We need to have a designated education, educational specialist or otherwise known as a teacher. Um, we really can't open a successful classroom without those people there. And of course, there'll be pairs and things um, as well, depending on which students they are and what their needs are. And then um, in addition to just the location, there's the physical design of the classroom. So we want to design it to be therapeutic. We want to design it to have the things that um, students need to calm down. If they're emotionally disturbed, they're going to need certain um, you know, equipment and furniture and placement and design, all of that goes into the structure of the class as well. Um, and we look to, there are some models. Um, we have, there's a county model that's um, brand new and um, just started this year. And we have a few students there um, and we'll probably be collaborating with them on their design also so that we can um, have something similar because it's being, it's a very successful model. Um, can I add? Yeah, please. Um, so just generally um, talking about not the therapeutic class, but just kind of where we're putting things, we consider a continuity. So if your child lives in a special day class in preschool, you would go to one site and the way it was designed before, you might have to transfer to a different site for a K2 SPC. And then if that child stays in special day class and they don't have a 3-5, then that's another school. So I, I think the typical experience of a student is going to one school, being part of that community, being with their siblings throughout. Um, so when we're looking at program locations for next year, we were trying to be strategic about um, kind of building that continuity for those kids so that we're not moving them several times and then they can really be part of that school community. Um, and I wanted to add to, we do have some programs that are more specific. So we have our special day classes that are um, for our moderate to severe population. There are fewer of them, but if you look historically we, at the middle school level, for example, both, we have two programs and they're both at the same school. So if you live anywhere in the district, you'd still have, and you needed that program, you'd still have to go to that one school. So we're trying to break it up so that you can go and attend closer to home and closer to where your peers are instead of just one location for both programs. Yeah, and also just to um, the, the heavy pressure of having a lot of special ed programs in one school, um, that's, a, that's a lot on the administration. It's, it's more IEPs. It's, there's, it, there's a lot of implications for the school itself when you have a heavy number of programs in one place. So we're trying to be a little bit more um, distributed and evenly balanced so that we don't have one school that has all this pressure. Um, one principal that spends every single day in IEPs because there's so many that they need to schedule in order to be in compliance. So this also kind of um, spreads, the, you know, shares the wealth, it spreads it out, it lightens the heavy pressure on, on classes or schools that have many, many programs in them. Yeah, no, I think that's really helpful. And I, I mean, I told, I know that we talked about the distribution and having the continuity yeah. and I, that's like great. I think that's absolutely the direction we should go. I think my question is really more around like, as we open up new programs at new sites, like how, what are the structures and systems we have in place to ensure that administrators, staff, community, like that it really is inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, we recently just found out about a situation where like parents were being not inclusive to a student with special needs at a school that typically doesn't serve students with special needs, right? Like that's counterproductive mm -hmm. to what we're trying to do, right? And so what are we doing to ensure that folks are like, that it's going to be in an actually inclusive environment as we're opening new types of classrooms mm -hmm. and classrooms at sites that are not used to having students with special needs like at their site, right? Which is, yeah, so that's more my question is around mm -hmm. like, what are we doing to ensure right. that those supports are in place? Well, yeah. well the, when you mentioned that, I think firstly, the, the most important person in the room is the teacher. 
other than the students, right? So I think about recruitment and finding a therapeutic, for example, as a therapeutic classroom teacher is paramount and getting out early to do that, um, which will require us to probably do some traveling, perhaps out of the Bay Area. But I think in that regard, knowing, for example, if we're gonna have a therapeutic classroom at let's say, you know, Bayside, getting with administration early, talking to the community, informing them and educating them about what is this program? What does it look like? What might the impact be on their site with the teachers? What can we do to support them with PD? Is there some kind of community event to make sure that the families are included? Because it is a big deal. I taught that classroom years ago. And to me, it's really about making sure that everybody understands what that program is about. What, how can we make sure those students in that program are included fully as possible, um, particularly in a therapeutic classroom, because oftentimes those kids really, they're not there for the academics, it's more behavioral. So that can be very disruptive to some environments. So recognizing that and knowing what can we do, get in front of it, educate the community, make sure the teachers are on board. Um, as uh, Heather said, having a school psych, a counselor, other support staff there as a team, getting that team early and then sharing it with the community and there's no surprises. So that's a great question. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I'm not gonna belabor the point, but like the questions are like, what are we gonna do to do that? I guess I'm looking for like, what are we gonna do? Well, right? hiring, so for me, it's about the hiring. <laughs> so I think right? like something to come yeah. back to, but I just hope that that's like front and top of mm -hmm. mind for us as we're thinking about these. No. I did have one question, but I'll see if other people, go ahead and open to your question. My other, well, are we doing questions and then comments and then well, like, what we is, can are just, we doing I think we process? can just do it all right. It's like a midway point. So it's a good time to like comment, mm -hmm. question. We can even go back to public comment for a little bit. Okay. It's, I, I think it's more of like a, it's a comment slash question. Um, I mean, I appreciate like seeing the layout of this. I know that I've asked for like something similar to this. So I appreciate that. And I like love the connection to the strategic plan and kind of knowing what you all are focused on. Um, I think it's really helpful and I think it's helpful to, you know, in terms of like communicating to parents and, and staff and all of that. And so I'm happy to hear that like that's in the works. Um, I guess my question on it or is just thinking about like, we think about these goals, like what were we, like, for example, if I take this first one on increasing student academic ability for students with disabilities, like, have we really like dug into root cause of why it's so low? What are like our quantitative goals for like, okay, here it is now. This is where we're hoping to go in a year. These are all the things like you talk about some of the things that we're going to do to get there. How are we like measuring the impact of them, right? Like I ask these same questions about everything, right? But that's like the kind of direction that I'm just wondering about how we're like really thinking about measuring our success with these things and communicating that um, to all of our stakeholders. And then my other, I guess, question slash comment is just like, there's a lot of different groups that are involved in terms of like, there's the inclusion task force and there's CDAC and there's the, you know, there's like all of these different, there's like the SLT, right? There's like all of these different groups. I guess my question is, is like, one, how are they all involved and invested in this? And how are we like bringing them along on this journey? And two, how do they all talk to one another so that it doesn't become like these silos, right? Because like inclusion, despite it being one stream of work is very interrelated with like a bunch of other areas. And so how do we like significant disproportionality and, you know, um, Anyway, so that was that's just like another like question slash comment. So not necessarily expecting you to answer these things now, but just more things that I'm thinking about as I look at this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me know. Why don't we just do you have any questions? Okay. Uh, maybe we can check in for public comment, uh, just it's kind of a midway point and see if there's anything. Hey, if there are any members in the audience that would like to make public comment using Zoom, please use the raise hand functionality within Zoom now. We have a couple members in the audience that would like to make public comment. Jennifer, we're going to start with you. I'm going to... Hi, 
Hi there. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Um, thanks very much. Um, I uh, apologize if there's noise in the background. Um, I just wanted to make a comment just about the um, potential plans for opening a therapeutic classroom. Um, my daughter is uh, at an NPS. Um, she's at Esther B. Clark. Um, and I appreciate Christy Watkins' questions about sort of how to make sure that students who are attending a therapeutic classroom on a public school campus are fully included. I can tell you that one reason that Esther B. Clark is effective is that all of the um, behavioral supports that are in place and the therapeutic supports that are in place are in place school-wide. So they are a part of every minute of every student's day. And so I think it's something really important to consider as we think about an ED classroom on a public school site, just as these children are going to mainstream classroom, how are those behavioral and therapeutic supports carried through? Um, so they're there for every minute of every day. Um, so I realize I'm sort of uh, repeating <laughs> Watkins' question, but just sort of on a very kind of um, practical level, um, I think that's something really important to consider. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. If there are any other members of the public comment that would like to make a public comment, please use the raise your hand functionality now. We are gonna move on to our next commenter. One moment. And Amy, go ahead, you have three minutes. Thank you so much. I just wanted to um, add on to um, what Trustee Watkins and what um, Jennifer just said about the ED classroom. And I, I guess I would just hope for some more clarification around um, the grade level span and what that would look like. I know the documentation indicated it could be at Bayside, um, but it was also in like that middle school um, row on the page. So I would be curious if in thinking about this, you're considering a six through eight classroom, or if you're considering a K through eight classroom, um, I know that there are many students um, in elementary grades as well who um, may need this kind of support. So just curious to get clarification on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. President Proctor, back to you. There are no more uh, comments on Zoom. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll pass it back to you. If there's anything you wanted to add after. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to add that um, the documentation that we put for 23 24, this is all a, like draft. So these are not um, that they fully confirmed, or it's more like thoughts and just looking at um, making a visual actually to kind of really see a more even placement. Um, and sort of what we're thinking about. Part of um, the concerns that were, were mentioned by both Amy and Jennifer is why we're starting this so early. So this is very, very early. We're just, you know, very, very beginning of November, we're talking about for next fall. That's the amount of time we're gonna need to make sure all these things are in place. And that's why we very intentionally started very early. Um, okay, so I just wanted to make sure I said that. And I also wanted to reassure everyone that this is a draft. So. I don't want anybody alarmed saying like, I didn't know. I mean, you know, these are just our, our preliminary thoughts about where things may, may go. And then we can move on, let's see, to staffing updates. Do you want to take that, Kira? Yes. Before you start, sorry, yeah. I didn't ask the question, but I just wanted to say, um, I recognize like, and I hope that I feel like our board knows this and we all know this and so do the parents of kids that have special needs, um, but maybe like we need to be more proactive um, as a community about messaging like the importance of inclusion and um, and giving kids like that stability because especially kids that have special needs need many of them not all right every child is different but need stability and routine, and that's actually really important for them. Um, so I just wanted to add that, and if we can help do that in any way. I, I'm, I just think about like, right, like the 
the, the situation that we have at one of our schools right now where um, I just, I, I empathize with that family, the, the teacher, the, even you all district leadership, like how do you, how do you confront that in a way that is compassionate, but also like very um, matter of fact, right? It's not a question, I'm just talking, but yeah. Okay, um, so Kira's gonna present um, some staffing updates where we are currently right now. Okay, so um, we are working very closely with our uh, human resources department and the partner agencies we work with to um, just on a continuous basis to get some of these things covered. Uh, Currently, we have 2.5 FTE, so two and a half positions of resource specialists that are, oh, I'm be, be loud. Uh, we have two and a half <coughs> positions for resource specialists that are open at this current time. Um, we do have temporary staff in place to cover um, at these different locations. Um, we reassigned our program specialist and a couple of different teachers um, for a temporary basis so uh, these students are receiving their services um, but we are continually looking for resource specialists uh, to serve in those roles um, so currently we don't have any openings for psychologists or special day class teachers um, we are in search of speech therapists as well um, we are talking to agencies and trying to work out different solutions um, like contractors to do maybe assessments as needed while we're waiting for a full-time speech therapist to become available. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add on to that, that um, locating speech therapists right now is bigger than just us. It's a huge problem um, in all districts. They're very, very difficult to find. Um, they do, they, there are some that provide um, virtual services, but we have not found that to be a successful model. Um, we tried it a little bit last year. It was not something that we were, would like to move forward with. Um, and the in-person therapists are just few and far between. Um, so I just want to make that. And actually, that's something that we're even hearing from families who receive private therapy, that even the wait list for the private therapists are really, really long right now. So um, that, that is uh, an actual problem and something that we're, um, you know, we're being as creative as possible and looking into different options for that, but we do have um, openings for speech therapists right now. Well, yes, and as I said, I think it's really important that we go, we're out early now, knowing mm -hmm. what our planning is for next year, and that we get in front of it. Typically, it's February, March when we start to really do interviews. We want to start in December, January, February. Um, and as I said, I think going out of the Bay Area because this market is so tight. So across the state, maybe traveling across the country to recruit specialized teachers because it's that competitive. Also speech therapists, um, many of them are qualified to work in other environments also. So they don't only work in schools, they may work in hospitals or clinical settings. Um, and so that's just, we're also competing with those markets just to be aware. Okay, do you wanna? We'll go to the cast. Yeah. There, there you go. Okay, uh, so for this section, we just wanted to highlight um, some of our statewide assessment data that's available. Um, so what you're seeing here and on the next slide is uh, a comparison of 2019 results and the 2022 results. Um, because of the pandemic, we did have a, a stoppage of testing. So we're kind of comparing pre-pandemic to just the, this last round in the spring. Um, so for English language arts, this is the results for um, all students in the district that take the statewide testing, so third through eighth graders, um, and the percentage of not met and then met exceeded. So um, this is encouraging because in 2019, 67% were not of students with disabilities were not meeting, but in 2022, we saw that number go down to 62%. So we do have a lot of work to do, but we did see an improvement there. Um, and then on the other side, this is uh, English language arts specifically, um, we had met and exceeded about 13% in 2019 
and now we increase that up to 18%. So still a lot of work to do in this area, but it is encouraging that that progress is there. Going in the right direction. And that was for English language arts. So I'm gonna, it will go. And this was B for mathematics and we saw a similar trend. So in math in 2019, 70% of our students with disabilities were not meeting the expectations and we saw that go down in 2022 to 66%. So again, it's good, we're moving in the right direction, but a lot of work to do still. Um, and then we saw something similar in the Met exceeded range for 14% in 2019 to 17.5% in 2022. So we just wanted to kind of highlight those specific areas. Can I ask a question on this just please? And, and if I'm being like totally dumb, just let me know. No. But um, when we look at, you know, this kind of data for general ed students, or I guess when we look at it for the whole district, it's it's broken up like by ethnicity, by like socioeconomic status. Do we not do that for um, special education? Like, do we not break this down small into different groups? Because I can imagine maybe a family with means, like maybe their students are um, bringing up the average while other um, other families maybe. That's so awesome. we can um, we can disaggregate it further. Um, one of the main categories that gets reported on is just students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So it's very broad because mm -hmm. yeah. that does contain students and in, in many more sub mm -hmm. subgroups. Right. Um, I think we can, one of the easiest ones to look at compared to maybe our overall group would be our dual identified students. Mm -hmm. So we can, and um, that's something we can do for you. I don't have that with me in front of me right now, but that's something we can do a side by side of um, dual mm -hmm. identified compared to the overall students with disabilities category. Yes, I think, I, I mean, I'm just like using my, like what I think what mm -hmm. we would see, and I'm thinking we're probably, we would probably see some similar like, gaps between different students and so I was just curious if we ever mm -hmm. zoom in that way. And keep in mind what uh, students with disabilities is a very broad category right. because it's every type of IEP you can think of included in that right. category so um, it ranges from everything from RSP to mod severe to emotionally disturbed to speech and language, speech and yeah. language only mm -hmm. um, so yeah you, it's um, it's not like it's just one type right, of student. Right. And I do think to that point, and I know sometimes it's difficult because you don't have enough students to like, you have to be careful. Statistically minus, relevant. You know, yeah, statistically yeah. relevant. You also have to be careful of like privacy, like, you know, when the numbers get too small, those sorts of things. But I do think to the extent that when we look at data, we can disaggregate. I think that's a really important one. Um, and, and I also think by um, designation, like to the extent possible, right? Like we can look at RSP versus mm -hmm. SPC versus speech and language only, mm -hmm. but like, mm -hmm. you know, because this is really encouraging. And like, if we see that this isn't happening in SDC, mm -hmm. like we need to really pay attention to that. If we see this isn't happening for like our dual, our, you know, students that are dual identified, like we need to really be paying attention to that. Um, and so I think it's important, like the next time that we take that to really be careful because I mean, I think, yes, like we should be encouraged and this mm -hmm. is like, it's great to see progress and like you see the data all over around like kids, particularly students with disabilities and, you know, all of the other groups of kids that we often look at that, you know, um, are really, really are not performing well after the pandemic. And this, to be clear, this is not performing well at all, but we are seeing improvement and that is, you know, something for sure that we should, that should be celebrated. Um, mm -hmm. And it also like will always like inform to do work. I had a question about, um, just to continue the thought, it's just going back to what you said earlier in the presentation about the over-identification of mm -hmm. Latinx males. So the thought is well, that would be an interesting thing to pull out as well. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. that's my thought. Okay. Um, do you know the exact number of the Latinx males that are in Latinx males? That... Is that one of the documents at the end it was in my presentation from august so we do have it um i don't have it in front of me right now no, we didn't. but the total yeah the percentages um are I, I, i'm a little i'm i don't want to speak inaccurately but mm -hmm. our total number of students it's around a thousand 
uh, right? With IEPs. With, with IEPs, it's about. Uh, it's about 1,300 with IEPs total of total, everybody. Yeah. Um, and I think that it, the number of Hispanic males, it was like, it was high. It was I like think it was, it was the Latinx mm -hmm. population with SLD, so it includes boys and girls. Yeah. I think it was around 200 yeah. kids. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have that. And actually, it's in, if you look back to the board presentation from August, it, it delineates that a little bit more carefully with the exact numbers. Yeah. So I know we have like the plan, like we have a plan to lower that number, but I'm just wondering if there's like an easy way. Um, maybe going, going forward, we like look at it every time, like, like how, is the number decreasing? Is it the right. same? Right. Yeah. And part of the issue right now is it's still a little early in the year. So this is about the time when we start to get referrals, right? Mm -hmm. And we're starting the interventions and, you know, um, kids first start, especially the little ones, a lot of them are, you know, it's, they're brand new to school, never been to school before. This is all fresh. They got to learn how to be a student. They got to learn how to do all of the little things that we kind of take for granted in, in classroom environments. So once they've worked through all of that, and then people are starting to say, I still have concerns. So it's a little hard to compare um, month to month yet, but as we move forward, we will keep an eye on that and pay attention to the number of referrals, the number of assessments, number of kids who are getting identified. Yeah, I guess um, the way that I look at it is like 100%, that's a big part of it, right? Like, let's like make sure that kids aren't being over referred, but then also for the students that are already mm -hmm. identified that sh maybe shouldn't be, mm -hmm. wh what's the plan for that? I know we've talked about it before. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the good thing about special education is the goal is to no longer qualify. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that's why we have the annual reviews and triennial assessments. So, you know, every three years they get reassessed. Um, and we parents or anyone can really call an IEP at any time. Um, a lot of times you hear the term like emergency IEP. There's really no such thing because an IEP can be called at any time. So we, we don't need to have emergencies. Um, but during those meetings and in those reviews, we're looking for progress on goals. And those goals are what the IEP is constructed of. And so as we're, as we're meeting and talking about the kids and their, what their goals are, and the services we provide to them should be tailored to those goals so that they're achieving those goals. So um, yes, we can reclassify kids. We can um, exit them from having an IEP. And that's a particular group we want to monitor and keep an eye on because we want to make sure we're not giving unnecessary services to kids and we want to make sure we're giving them services in the areas that they need so that they eventually no longer require it yeah i guess um i, I wonder it is three years right to, to be classified as needing special education and then to wait three years I, I just think about like a lot of families i know wouldn't necessarily know that they can ask for an IEP anytime and why that would be beneficial mm -hmm. unless it's like explicitly explained to them in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wonder, I'm just throwing it out there, like, what, and I want to know like what the impact would be on staff, but like, would it make sense to just say, well, for this group of kids, because they're over identified, we actually want to do the IEP every year so that we can have more urgency around, around, I don't know, it, it, it's interesting though, because it's like, if they really need, and they are in special education, because, because they need it, then we don't want to, like, push them out. Like, take it. services away that yes. they need. No, yes. and we wouldn't do that. But if they yeah. don't, if they, if they were, I don't know, it's just, it's just like a weird, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's complicated, right, because if you were assessed, then you, uh, I don't know, I know we've talked about this in depth and I'm, I've had a super long day, so that's why I've been kind of quiet, my head hurts and everything. <laughs> I think my, my point is, could we develop a plan to, have more urgency around IEP meetings and parent engagement with Latinx male students since we know they're over identified? So I, that's a great question. And it actually reminded me that um, we've received some sort of preliminary reviews. The state, because we're in 
significant disproportionality. They um, meet with us and we've developed, um, like Dr. Haven is uh, overseeing our CSACE plan. Mm -hmm. And part of that is the CIGDIS. Um, and so we have um, assigned people who work with us on um, reviewing our schools to watch. They've identified a couple of schools that they really want us to kind of focus on in particular because they think that maybe um, the attention on those would um, disrupt what's happening. Um, and one of the big areas they want us to focus on is the middle schools. Um, so we're doing that. Also, um, there are some, I, I hear what you're saying there, but there are some limitations in terms of what we can do because there's so much federal law around IEPs. Mm -hmm. So there are some things that like, it would be wonderful if we could, could yeah, you know, all the pull people out. That need to be pulled into, uh, yeah, yeah. That, and that's what I was kind yeah. of referring to. Like, it, the yeah, just, like, assessments take a really long time, mm -hmm. um, and it is an uh, you know it's an enormous amount of work. Typically, there's a psychological educational um, evaluation. There's also an academic assessment, and then in some cases there are more. There are like um, occupational therapy assessments or um, physical therapy, or you know kids that have um, other unique needs. There's other kinds of evaluations that might might go into it. So it can be um, like a huge battery of testing, which and that too is hard on kids. Um, yeah. And so, and then there's rules about how often you can do it, which tests you can use uh, within a certain amount of time um, after having been tested. So if you if we use one exam to evaluate you, we can't use it again for a while. <clears throat> it has to be a different one. Let's check in with superintendent. I have my hand raised. I've yeah. been oh, uh, raising <laughs> my hand for minutes now. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, I'm I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you all something. Okay, this is data. This is this is fresh data. Okay. So I'm gonna share my screen, give me a second here. Make sure I have this capability, there we go. All right, you guys have seen these, these <laughs> images from me before. Will you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Can I get a thumbs up from somebody? Not yet, no, you no. You can yes. see it, all right. This is San Mateo Foster City School District test scores four years ago. I've toggled it so it's showing you sixth grade. I've toggled it so it's showing you students with disabilities. In math, 6.8% of kids four years ago, students with special needs were meeting or exceeding standards and 82% were not. Now, let's look at the state. This is 1819, four years ago, state of California. Same grade level, same groups, nine and a half percent and 74.4%. Okay, neither is particularly good. There's like a lot of work to do, right? But what did you all do as a board to switch how we educate kids in sixth grade? You came up with a heterogeneous math experience that affected thousands of kids and reverberating even more this year and, and continuing next year. Students with special needs were in those math classes. They were a party to this new way of teaching. So now this is the state of California this year. I toggled it to this year. The data looks the same as it did four years ago. So now I'm gonna show you what our data looks like after the very powerful and systemic change this board and our educators, your wonderful special educators and math teachers implemented to have dramatic change. This chart is not like, oh, it went up a little bit. This is like, wow, like 82 and a half percent four years ago to 65.9 percent. That's, I'm telling you, it's very hard to move a district our size. But what this board did with, by partnering with the educators and listening to those, and then facilitating our, our work with the additional math coaching and the additional PD and the high quality curriculum is you put these kids on the path to success. This is very powerful work. And it, and it sort of underlies how, from my perspective, we continue to move forward with our students with special needs because 16.5% is also not extraordinary when compared to the whole district average. 
but it's a huge step in the right direction. It's an, it's an important step. Um, and I just wanted to call that out because I think this board um, has done a great deal um, in the last couple of years to make equity happen for these kids to make equity and and in this case equity is benefiting children with special needs in a very obvious way in an irrefutable way um and when we get the results at the end of this year which my prediction will be better than these results um i think we're going to be sitting sitting in this in this meeting a year from now saying keep going what next because that's you know ultimately this board is sort of you know, characterized by you all will celebrate for about five minutes before you start talking about what we're going to do now next. So now this is good, but so now tomorrow, what's going to start happening? That's just kind of who you are as a board. And that's great because you have a team that's trying to catch catch that lightning in a bottle. So I, as you know, I told our school board president, I'm, I'm at a, at a, state uh, administrator conference. I have a, a region meeting I'm gonna run to, but I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you all for for um, the forbearance and, and have a great rest of your night. Well, thank you for sharing that also. That was good to see. Okay, so um, I did include a little bit of information at the end. I wasn't really planning to present it, but I did put this just at the end um, of the slides here. There's some fiscal information. This is actually a repeat from information I already shared, but just in case we needed it for reference in our conversations today, it is there. So I just wanted to make sure that you saw that. Do you want it presented? Um, I don't know. It's up to the board. Would they like it presented? I mean, yeah, yeah, you've seen it. It's 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 not new. It's just um, I wanted it there in case any questions came up for reference. Anything else? Comments? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Um, <laughs> um, no, I'm, that, that was awesome. And I'm looking forward to like seeing more mm -hmm. more of that. Um, uh, one of my questions is around, so I know that we've done like a lot of reconfiguration of staff, you know, staffing and how we staff, we talked a little bit about that with the behavior response team, and, um, and there's been like other internal structural changes, mm -hmm. um, and I guess my question is like, again, <laughs> how are we like tracking, for, like, this is great, and we're investing resources, and like, what's the impact, so one thing I immediately thought about is like, I know that, um, we have, it's not activated. Maybe it is like uh, the behavior. What is the CDC uh, Board certified behavior analyst. Okay. And are those, those are folks that are signed by Complex? Yes. There's three of them. So they each have one complex to themselves and then they share the smallest complex. Got it. Yeah. And then I think you probably talked about this before, but their role is like working with teachers mainly with so directly they um yeah so their their main role is to um they're they're deployed kind of um on a like sort of on a not i want to say emergency basis but when there's a situation where a student is, is struggling they'll go meet with the principal they'll visit the classroom they can offer coaching to the teacher they can provide coaching to the paras if there are any working with the student mm -hmm. Um, they may do some direct work with this student, but mostly that's not their capacity. They can, but um, it's more about building the capacity of the rest of the team so that they have things and structures in place. They'll do some observations um, typically. And then the other thing that I've really been encouraging this year, and most of our schools have, um, have started doing this, but not 100%, is um, they're working with the gen ed staff in staff meetings to train them on some of the behavior techniques that we use um, in special education, because they're, it's not, I mean, these are very highly level, highly, highly trained behaviorists um, that they have a skill set that's far beyond um, what a typical educator has. And so they're able to like build the capacity of those gen ed teachers so that they can do some of the strategies and techniques in their classroom to interrupt behaviors or provide support. So yeah, they're, they're working with the whole school team but um, not as much like I wouldn't put a BCBA with just 
one kid. Yeah. Um, I, I would prefer for them to be training the RBTs and the parents and the, and the gen ed teachers and the principals of the schools so they know what to do if there's issues. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and part of the reason why I asked because I was just wondering like where are the places to be able to track that impact. So I'm thinking like if, for example, there's a classroom that's struggling and you have a BCBA and they, you know, I'm just making this okay. right? They spend 40 percent of their time in classroom X what then do we see in classroom X in terms of like academic gains and other gains mm -hmm. that are different from what we see in classroom Y where like they didn't have that kind of support, mm -hmm. right? Like what are the ways that work to really be able like, I'm not arguing that these are good investments at all. I just think it's really powerful to be able to say these are good investments and this is how we can prove that right. this was a good investment and this is an impact on kids and on teachers um, and just like really being able to draw that through line. Um, so yeah, just thinking a little bit about that. I think um, one way we can track that, and it's something, again, it's a little early in the year, but we can start paying attention to it, is reduced referrals. Because referrals, um, especially up until probably halfway through last year, um, many of them are, are driven by behaviors that people feel like um, they don't have the tools to deal with. And so we should see a reduction in those types of referrals and a reduction in those types of um, initial IEPs too. So that, you know, we're, we're, you know, getting it, we're getting ahead of the game. We're getting ahead of the problems before it turns into something that becomes a special ed problem. Mm -hmm. And that's something we can do for you. We can like take a look at the numbers of referrals and um, throughout the course of the year. Um, I think we could probably, I think the first time to do like a good, dive would be maybe December because by then we would have a better idea of you know it's something that we could compare it to whenever it logically makes sense yeah it's just like probing for us to be like thinking about yep. this as we're implementing all of these things right like what do we expect to see what kind of change do we want and like how mm -hmm. do all of these strategies align with that and how do we demonstrate that so then when we think about next year it's like okay well this didn't work as well as this and so we want to put more into BCBAs because not only are we seeing reduced decent referrals but oh interestingly enough, this like one classroom that had all the support mm -hmm. also saw a 10% jump on the task, right? Mm -hmm. Because we know that kids are in class and their behavior is supported and they're gonna do better academically too, right? So how do we begin to like, just be really targeted in the kinds yeah. of support that we're, which we are already, I understand that. Yeah. Like even more so. The other correlation that I would be looking for is um, we should see, and now this would take a while for it to go into effect, but a reduction in SCIA assessments, and that's the request for like a one-to-one -one para, mm -hmm. that should go down. Be and it's going to take a while, right? Because a lot of a lot of students have them already. Mm -hmm. But um, if the classroom teacher and other people on campus and the principal and all of the people in that student's team have these skills and are employing them, um, and the RBTs are being brought in, we shouldn't um, have to be assigning as much one-on-one, -on -one and which is the most restrictive setting and it's you know our goal in special education is least restrictive i mean that's the law is least mm -hmm. restrictive environment so that's um that's a correlation we will look for we'll probably need a, a i'm going to say more than a whole year of employment to see like that effect happen because all of the current ips are the, the skills are already there right so they're not going away um but that's that's the goal is to see that number reduced like reduce more thing. Well, if the other people oh, think I'm gonna keep going. No, we're here for it. Good point. No, but I don't want to dominate the conversation. So dominate. <laughs> Jump in. You have no, I'm you I'm, I'm working on it. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Go ahead. One more question. Or two more questions. Sorry, I said two. Um, one is so years ago, before any of you I think were in, in these roles, um, we asked for special education audit. And we, there was a lot of resources put into the special education mm -hmm. audit. And I was realizing the other day, I was like, huh, we haven't talked about the special education mm -hmm. audit in a really long time. And so I was just wondering to the extent that you all have used that as a reference point for any of the work that we're doing. And if not, I think it would be a good thing to return to because there were a lot of really specific suggestions and like plans put in place as a result of that um without being too sarcastic that like we did they really totally do mm -hmm. <laughs> um and so i just feel like that's just something i want to mm -hmm. um 
And then the last thing is, um, it kind of builds off of what I was saying about the, like what are the structures and systems that we put in place as we're like, you know, the, uh, as we're thinking about continuum, as we're thinking about opening new classes, and like also building off of like this situation where, you know, there's like a student that it's not even other students, it's like parents, which is just like no tolerance for that, right? It like actually makes me sick to my stomach to think about. I feel like um, one of the things that I've been thinking about, and I mentioned to Superintendent Ochoa was um, for us to pass a, to, for, for us to be presented with a resolution um, related to special education, thinking about inclusions and modeling it off of the equity task force resolution um, in a way that encourages us to, in collaboration with community members to like review board, po board policies related to special education. Because I think that there's a through line between um, like if there are policy, like I want our administrators and our district staff and our educators to feel like supported in the way that you all address those kinds of situations. And like, I think there's some overarching statements that we can make about like our values as a district and like what kind of behavior is and isn't tolerated and how we treat kids, um, all of them. And also like, yeah, just ensuring that our policies reflect that. I also think there's a place for like some of the questions that we've been sharing around data and just like, really deep data analysis and how we're tracking that and then how we're using the next drive impact. A lot of those things that were kind of like embedded in this overarching resolution from a few years ago, but and it doesn't have to be exactly that. But I, sh I shared one example that's like just, a, um, I have a, like a friend who's a board member in another district in the South Bay and she authored a resolution um, that they adopted and to share that with data I can share with you all as well. Um, and then I, there's probably other I've seen out there. Oh, yeah. Okay. You shared it. Perfect. Perfect. So, yeah, that would be, I think that would be great. And I know that there's like some parent interest in that. And I know that um, Trustee Proctor included you in an email about mm -hmm. it because I had heard that you were um, interested in something similar. Yes. And actually, um, Superintendent Ochoa and I and Amy had a call um, because she was also interested in getting. Um, starting a group that can start looking at policies um, similar to what the equity task force is doing, but looking at them from the special education lens and just um, doing some policy review and making sure that everything is um, inclusive and, and keeping um, special education students in mind as well. So thank you. That's, it's to be, to be uh, coming soon, I guess. Okay. I did, but I wasn't sure. Are we going to talk about the DNQs or? Um, so I, that is the same. That's part of the same information that I shared in August, but I wanted it here just in case, um, just as a reference point for any questions that come up. Um, it is tied to uh, many things that we've talked about tonight. I think um, one of the, well, do you want to ask your question and then can, I can speak no, to I, it? I or know, do you just want to talk about it? Is number seven and I just didn't want to go there. Yeah, no, I, I included it on the discussion points in case it came up. Um, it's not new information. It's all things that we've discussed before. Um, but it does tie into SIGDIS. It does tie into over referrals. It does tie into NTSS and what we're doing, you know, prior to referrals. Um, and I think to me that DNQ list, it's, it's huge. There's a hundred kids that were assessed and didn't qualify. Um, that the concern for me is just that the pretty much all of those students really were over referred and fortunately the the assessments didn't qualify them they're not getting services that they don't need but um, it does it does sort of illustrate a system where we are jumping to assessment too early and so that's that's what that speaks to me great thank you so mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess I'll go on. So one of the, I should, I have in my notes, the same thing that Trustee uh, Walken had talked about was the audit. And so mm -hmm. one of the thoughts was, is that there was back in the day, a matrix and everything else. And it was either yellow, green, red, or whatever it was. We have since, and this is pre-pandemic, we have since sort of turned the whole special education department upside down and everything is different a little bit. But yeah, we still have some of those things that 
are still, I wouldn't say haunting us, but are still important that we're still looking at, such as the third year in a row being um, on the state list of over identification of Latinx. So in the future updates, I'd love sort of along the same line of Trustee Watkins is sort of have some sort of like, what happened with that? Is it now not applicable anymore? Is it like there's stuff there that, that well, this is actually really important, but yet we didn't have anybody here or there. Like, just to kind of like circle back to that, because mm -hmm. I remember we had those two consultants speak right there at that podium and they went through a whole list of everything that we need to do. Um, and so it'd be just, it'd be just great to kind of circle back and figure out what was there and what wasn't. And there may be some stuff there that we just don't do anymore now or that we just do differently uh, because we have shaken things up. So mm -hmm. I, it'd be just great to know. Um, just off of my notes, just going through the presentation and everything, I'm glad we're putting the sensory room into at Lead Elementary. I'm pretty sure Parkside had one because I revisited it a while ago. Right, thank you. We do. So there, um, this is similar to inclusion. Um, the district has uh, implemented sensory rooms in a variety of places. It wasn't consistent and there's no like district standard for it. Yeah. So it might be a school had um, the funds or they had one time yeah. monies or they fundraised it for it themselves yeah. and they kind of bought items yeah. they wanted, um, but it wasn't uh, like, a con like a consistent uniform process. So the purpose of the one at LEAD was really to create a beautiful, very structured, very um, purposeful yeah. occupational therapy yeah. infused sensory room. Yeah. Um, and then to use that as our sort of model for other rooms moving forward. And the, the goal is really to make sure that we have them available, um, starting with especially a preschool SDC students and then the primary SDC yeah. kids too. Great, yes. Yep, Great. Meadow Heights has one, yeah. Parkside has one. Um, I think I'm missing there's another yeah, one somewhere. George Hall. George Hall has Meadow one. Heights one. Yeah. yeah. And so, mm -hmm. no, so the, the idea, and this is great, I'm glad you're tying into the occupational therapist because um, I do think they're really important and vital, but there's that sort of circle back, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers, I'm glad Superintendent Ochoa showed that it is positive. We're moving in the right, the right direction, so I'm optimistic about that. Um, I would be, so I'm just gonna go off on some of the questions and notes that I have as I, I've gone through. Um, I love the, the idea because about the continuity and when we talk about the school complexes, I mean, we've sort of talked about this before a little bit and before way back when we had the audit, it was all about the push in and sort of inclusion. And, you know, there was a lot of students being moved from school to school to school. And it was, it was just dependent on which grade they were in. Yeah. And so how do you build a community? How do you build continuity? How do you build a, a belonging to mm -hmm. a specific school? And you, you kind of did it. So I didn't, I like where this is going. I feel that the continuity will lead towards more inclusion because they will feel like a self sort of belonging, like it's ownership there and students in the school. And I think that is great because uh, we do have some schools that um, their community and culture is very inclusive. Um, and I, I would want to see that in all of our schools um, towards our special ed students. The, um, the reason why I brought up the DNQs is um, I'd love to get a better grasp of sort of the timelines, whether it's the DNQs or the IEP timelines or the referral to timelines, when someone actually asks for it, I know that there is, as uh, Trustee Corzo had mentioned, there is a bunch of people that have to be in the room when you look at one of the referrals. And sometimes it's a scheduling thing, sometimes it's just a staffing thing, but I'd love to have a better grasp of the timeline there. So when someone actually goes ahead and requests it, what are, what's the required timelines? And then what is sort of best practice? And, and are we meeting those? Because when I look at the DNQs, you know, definitely the ones that we have had, you know, that are older, there's some lengthy timelines, you know, six months or more. But as the recent ones, I mean, you're looking at two months and I think that's pretty good, yeah. you know, on average or so. So um, I kind of would like to know and have a better grasp of that. Can I speak to the legal yeah. timelines? Yeah, sure. Um, so when there's a request for assessment, um, the rec the requirement is a 15 day response, not necessarily yes or no. It's 
the team needs to respond either by convening an SST, the student success team, or providing an assessment plan. So it's 15 days from the initial referral, which is in the, the last column. Um, and then once that assessment plan is signed, so say they sign it the same day, it starts a 60 day window where all of the assessments need to be completed and the IEP needs to be held. Um, it's told for, so the timeline stops for really long vacations, anything over 10 school days, um, but generally it's, it's uh, the 60 day timeline. Um, the interesting thing about this list is that it's got, you know, our district schools, but also um, something called the San Mateo Foster City PLC. It's a preschool learning community. So, um, so those students actually have a different timeline associated with them because we need to test them when they turn three. So instead of uh, school age kids where we're working with a school year timeline, um, that the preschool age population is by their birthday and it's starting uh, when they turn three. And we work with the uh, Golden Gate Regional Center for students who are already identified with needs to get those ahead of time. But unless you have a referral for that, then it would just be whenever the parent um, requested it. But so I think it kind of speaks to, you can see there are large gaps of time for some of these. And I think it's in part because, well, I mean, this was for last year too. These are for the entire school year. Um, there are, you know, preschoolers, three and four year olds, you can't really test them on the computer. And there were chunks of time where that's really the only way we could assess. So that kind of pushed us out of timeline for a lot of those. Um, so whereas we would have, because we were out of timeline, we assessed anyway, um, because we were already kind of out of that window. Um, but a, a lot of the PLC ones, um, they're just so young. You, I don't know how useful it's going to be trying to get a kid to a three-year-old to sit on Zoom yeah. for some and of assess those assessments. For a yeah. psychoeducational report, right? So just from my knowledge, you go through the assessment, you find out actually there's either the do not qualify as the DQs, mm -hmm. or actually, hey, this person does qualify. Then what is the, there's a legal timeline, right? To get this is the IP or what is that window? So within those 60 days, you have to complete the report yeah. and then hold the initial, they call it an initial meeting. Oh, okay, yes. And it's yeah. initial whether they qualify or not. Yeah. So even okay. if they don't qualify, we still refer to that meeting as an initial. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when we would review the report and the team decides this child does require special education or this child does not. But that, yeah, so it's at the end of those the 60 days since the AP is signed, the assessment plan is signed. Okay, so then from that 60 days, is there actually within that window, we are actually developing the IEP and everything mm -hmm. else that, so we mm -hmm. need it within that 60 days. Yeah, and so the goals yeah. are developed and that initial is the, the first, it's the beginning of their belonging within special education. Yeah. So they would go for the assessments that were completed right. and then make recommendations for areas of need that they would have goals and they talk about it as a team. Um, but when, then once that initial meeting happens, the parents kind of review it, go through it. And you know, uh, often we have parents who have further questions, but once they sign consent, we are able to start yeah. services. So two questions, we mm -hmm. need parental consent. They right? have to sign. To go yeah. through the, the assessment, right? Yeah. yeah. Great. And, sometimes and they have to sign the not only for the assessment plan, but they also have to sign the IEP in order yeah. for us to start providing services. Right, because I know that in the past, we've had <coughs> issues where parents actually have not wanted to sign the IEPs, and then mm -hmm. that shows up on our timeline that, hey, something's sort of out of compliance or something doesn't work here, but mm -hmm. partly because the parents didn't want to actually. Or they don't agree with or it. Or they don't agree with mm -hmm. it, right. And then, so going back, the, the SST, is that the initial review or is that the company? An SST is a function of general education. Okay. That's kind of more like pre-referral, but yeah. even I, we're trying really hard as the district to separate that for years. Um, the idea was that like SSTs were like the gateway into special yeah. education. It was like step one and it's really not. Um, it's, it's a time for the team to, like Diego said earlier, it's a time for the, the whole educational team in the gen ed setting to say, what does this kid need? Because they're struggling in some area, whether it's behavior or academically or whatever it is, and to give them whatever that is for a proven amount of time to see if it works. Because um, in the olden days, it would be like, we had the SST, 
we it, and it was just more of like a like a formality i guess and then everybody like okay let's assess them because we have the ssd now we're saying no we're not we're, we're giving actual um you know proven interventions we're going to monitor this kid we're going to do all give them the things that he, he or she needs and then you know way further down the line would it be um a conversation about this kid needs special ed now though my only caveat to all of this is every single kid is different and there are some students who do require special education right off the bat and we are obligated to find them and so i don't want to say that we like are saying no to everyone mm -hmm. um it's just that in general pra best practice is to address that sst or the student study team um in the gen ed setting prior to jumping to assessment but there are going to be students that require assessment right away great thank you so i have one more question and then comment under the staffing mm -hmm. uh, positions and i'm glad that we're going out and looking for them now um are these positions considering how difficult these positions are mm -hmm. and how in high demand they are um and considering that you know, we start hiring now, you're looking at 10 months later when we actually start, or let's say we hired in December, right? August comes around when we start school, eight months, stuff happens. We've had just recently, I think two of our, our vacancies right at the beginning of school were because um, a spouse got a new job out of the state and then someone was like, right, things happen. Out of state. Yeah, things mm -hmm. happen. So after COVID or after the craziness of COVID, I forget which year, I know that we sort of in some ways overhired teachers to to address that, right? We were being to offset it. Mm -hmm. To offset it because we knew that there's gonna be some teachers who might just not show up, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. like the term ghost, yes, they, they basically just don't show, right? So is this or are these positions one where we actually think about that and think that maybe we should just like, hey, this person's really good, we should grab them. And then we either keep them sort of in the district office or what, because that's what we've done in the past. Yeah. So um, Dennis knows because he's worked for years in HR. Um, in the past, that wasn't our practice because we tied every single vacancy to yeah. a job position, right? right? Yep. Um, we haven't changed that policy, you know, um, like in board policy or anything, yep. Yep. but in conversations with um, HR and with the superintendent's office, we are looking at sort of stacking our decks and grabbing them early and grabbing as many as we need. We know that we always have openings in special ed, even if we think we're fully staffed. I mean, sometimes in March, we were like, hey, we're looking good. And then by July, you've got 10 openings, yeah. right? So yeah. we know that those are gonna happen. We've been down this path before. We are going to aggressively hire um, and do it very early. I've actually already had somebody sign a contract for next year. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think I was the first one, first one. Um, but we are, you know, we're, we're doing that early. We're doing it hard. And as Dennis mentioned, we may be searching outside of the area and looking for ways to entice people to come here. Um, but yes, uh, to answer your question, the answer is yes. I think that that kind of pool hiring and doing it ahead of openings and being just sort of anticipating that things are going to change is really the only way to address it. Uh, thank you. And the last question that I have is uh, you made a comment about sort of the testing, like, okay, it's been a couple of months or so, and now we just probably start getting referrals in now, right? Mm -hmm. Because the mm -hmm. students come in. That was a comment referring to like sort of like our newer students, right? Um, because I'm, I'm assuming that for the students that we've had, you know, maybe the third graders, maybe the fourth graders, they've been in our district for a while. So it would seem that we kind of know the previous we have year, that previous year, hey, we might know that the student might need some testing. And so when they go from third grade to fourth grade or fourth to fifth or whatever, right, they might start showing some signs and we might, mm -hmm. we might need to test yeah. them. So the two months may not, you know, we might we'll try and be. So, we we so don't wait. Would, wait. So yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah, We're not going to wait yeah. if, if, if there's enough evidence to show yeah. that it's time yeah. to assess a student, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so we wouldn't like I say like, no, 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 I still, you know, it, like yeah. we, so we do have active assessment plans okay. signed now. We do okay. have kids being assessed okay. now. Um, the thing that we're, the area that we're focusing on is the primary, 
those are the ones we're really worried about. Like give these little guys a chance to learn how to be a kindergartner or a first grader, especially since, you know, they, some of them, they're really like formative years were spent online. So give them a chance to learn how to be a student, give them a chance to practice being at school um, because we'll see probably an increase in their behavior and improvements that, you know, we don't want to jump to conclusions too early. Yeah. Yeah. Great. No, but yeah, for the older I, kids. Yeah. Yeah. Cause my, my mind works is like, it's sort of like, well, there's the year over year and you know, you know, after a couple months, there's referrals, there's like the HRs, mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. certain things, there's timelines that happen. Right. But in the end, there are our students. And if we know kind of ahead of time that, hey, these students might need some extra help, then those timelines, it doesn't matter whether they're in third or fourth grade. I mean, the timelines, general timelines don't really work. No, it's, and it's the same. Once, it, once um, an assessment plan is signed, and that decision to sign it, it has to do with you know, who requested it yeah. and what the reasons for the request were. But once that assessment plan is signed, then the, the clock starts ticking the same for everyone. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Last comment. <laughs> I'm you don't have to out question me. No, yeah. I'm not out questioning hey, you. I just, I just <laughs> like my thoughts. It's just a thought process. So. <laughs> they put it to one that was my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna no. have to ask another one now. <laughs> yeah, you, you should. You should. There's all these things that come up. Um, it's all learning processes, right? And um, sort of when I we've gone through special education updates many times sort of now. Um, it, to me, it's sort of, it's, um, and maybe this is just the way my mind works, is that we have 1,300 students with the IEPs now, right? And But we're also talking about the referrals, and there's like two separate things there. And so when I look at the presentation and everything, I feel like it's all sort of there. We're all talking about everything. But there are actually two separate things, right? We're trying to reduce referrals, trying to catch them early, trying to do all these different things. But it's also, I want to also know that for those who are, have the IEP, Already. it's like, what are we doing? What are the supports we're doing? All those different things. And to me, it's sort of like, it's all combined. And in my head, I kind of want to know, like, you know, almost like breaking them out because there's just, there's, it's just, there's different tactics for each one. Mm -hmm. sort of. This is my final comment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Go share. <laughs> and my, this is really my last one. No, I just had one question about, um, actually, not one question about interventions. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've, heard, we've talked a lot recently about like some of the general interventions with regards to like math boost and well, the, okay. They seem to be interpreted as general education interventions in the way that the presenter will receive. And so I'm just wondering if, how accessible are those? Are students with special, I mean, special needs, particularly those in our community classes included mm -hmm. and things like math boost. And I know we're thinking about things like reading, et cetera. Yes, <laughs> yes, they are. Um, our students with special needs are included in the math boost invitations. So they are um, receiving those. And then, um, in terms of what other like PAP or I mean PAP is Jenna, that's just the curriculum mm -hmm. for the kindergarten yeah, yeah, yeah. first graders. I meant more like things like math. Boost, yeah, or yeah, SD math like and pretty pretty strong school. representation, right? If you're like looking at the data and you're like, yeah, that's a great improvement. And mm -hmm. over 80% of the kids are like not at grade level enough, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, even in like the grade level where you see the most improvement. So you think there'd be the strong representation, but I just um yeah, so maybe if you wouldn't mind just like just you can just like share a little bit more information about what that looks like. Um, um, sure. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? I, I'll just say mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm really excited. What are we just going down? No, I know. I'm just, I, I just, I found one of my back. last page <laughs> comments here in the windows. I'm very excited about the roadmap and what we're going to very optimistic. I love the fact that we're tied into the strategic plan. I love the comment that we just, you know, the field trip and everything else is super exciting. Um, I just, it's it's been sort of a roller coaster, and I think we're we're moving, and I, I'm really happy. So um, I just want to thank you guys for all your hard work and everything, and everybody else thank on the team and everybody else. Yeah. So. Yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, thank you. Yeah.
Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this is a great meeting and um, I appreciate you sharing kind of the successes and challenges and, and, and all that. And I know that we were supposed to do a special update, um, I think in August, mm -hmm. um, but this, I'm glad we were able to do it now mm -hmm. and really appreciate it. Um, if there's nothing else, we can move to item 7A, which is adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Okay, thank you, Trustee Watkins and Trustee Corzell. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that's everyone. Uh, we, will, we will adjourn at 7.15 p.m. Thank you. Thank you.